Well, we're come here. I want you to turn, if you would, uh, to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. And you probably are thinking, uh, I thought we were in 1 Corinthians. Uh, you never finished it. And we were, and we will finish it at Easter time in April. But uh, that may bring up another question in your mind. Why, if we're in Hebrews, are we beginning in the second to last chapter of Hebrews? And that's because we're, that's where we left off. I know it was years and years ago. <laughs> Some of you weren't even, you weren't even here uh, uh, to hear the first part of Hebrews. But, but some, re- some reason, some probably good reason, I uh, didn't finish Hebrews. And I've always wanted to come back to it uh, and uh, finish this uh, uh, middle of the 12th chapter and, and the 13th chapter. So that's what we'll do for the next month or so. And, and so we're, we find ourselves right here. Now, Hebrews is a great book. Uh, read through it. Um, Hebrews is a a sermon, really, put to pen. Chapter 13, verse 22, the writer of it says it's a word of exhortation that has been sent to them as a short letter. And so it was a sermon, an early church sermon. We sometimes think early Christians would have had very simple sermons where we listen to secular uh, thinking on this, that Christians were... And not very educated Christians were, and the early church were not um, really thinkers too much. And this uh, the book of Hebrews shows you that's not true at all. For it's probably the most articulate and defined argument and argumentation in the entire New Testament. Uh, one scholar put it this way, when we read Hebrews, we're exposing ourselves to early Christian preaching. Now, we don't know who was the preacher, uh, we do know who were the congregation, or at least what the situation of the congregation was. It was written to Jewish believers, hence Hebrews, who were tempted to give up. They were uh, under pressure to go back to Judaism, to give up on uh, Jesus as the Messiah and look for another. And the writer throughout the book is pleading with them to stick with Jesus. And he makes his arguments and says uh, Jesus is better than anything you can find in Judaism, anything you can find in the Mosaic Covenant. Better than anything there. Jesus is better than any of the Old Testament prophets. That's where he starts in the early verses of chapter 1. He's better than the angels throughout chapter 1, better than Moses, Joshua's rest, David, Aaron and his priesthood. Uh, Jesus gives a better word. You'll find that in the book of Hebrews, a better rest, a better priesthood, a better hope, a better covenant, founded on better promises, giving better possessions. It offers a better sacrifice. Christ offers a better sacrifice, um, uh, grants a better country that's coming ahead. Even a better resurrection is mentioned in this book. And so Hebrews has been called the book of better things because of that. Uh, The Old Testament was good. It was temporary but it was surpassed by Christ's coming. The new covenant is better. It is uh, best. Uh, Just thinking of this, Christ is uh, is being presented to this group of of Christians as as the best, and they are not to settle for anything but the best. Uh, uh, Nothing less than that. He is the final word from God to us, and that there is nothing... Um, but him. It's either him or nothing. And we must hear him through the New Testament or we will hear nothing from God. And so he really is telling them that if you leave Jesus, you lose it all. Uh, You can't have some kind of synchronism, as some people would say today, of Christianity and other faiths there. It's either Jesus and all that Jesus is and what he's done, or it's nothing. And so the book of Hebrews is a book about perseverance. It's a book about not quitting, of staying on the course with Christ until you see him face uh, to face. To stay on, as one person put it, believers uh, have all they need in Jesus Christ and should hold on to the end, come what may. And so chapter 12, we're entering into that, uh, is, uh, gives us a wonderful picture for that, uh, a practical image of running the race. The Christian life is like running a race. Chapter 11, it was all those who had run before us. It was those who uh, have faith in, in the promises of God and that we in our race now are surrounded by those who have gone before us and that we are like in a stadium that all eyes are upon us 
And we must get rid of anything that, that gets in the way as a runner would let go of anything that would encumber him or her. He would get it out of the way. And we must run the race, he says, marked out for us. It's marked out. It's a course that we're to run. And that we're to fix our eyes on Jesus. Jesus, who, who has gone before us into heaven, who's exalted, and who will perfect our faith, and who is at the, the, at the finish line. He's there waiting for us. Um, and, and so as, as he goes through chapter 12, he moves into that image of perseverance, that theme of perseverance, and, and talks about that it will be hard because of that. Be, there will be hardship, there will be pain, there will even be discipline from our Heavenly Father. <laughs> And we're to endure the hardships of life as discipline from him. And now the text we're going to take starts at verse 12 of chapter 12. And the writer comes back to the running metaphor saying, in other words, this is, this is what the race really entails. This is what the race really means. Uh, these are the details. These are the specifics of the race. And he gives seven exhortations, seven exhortations that uh, he wants us to have. And I'm going to give those seven to you in five points in the sermon, but we'll group the last three together. But here are the seven. This is the word of the Lord from uh, chapter 12, verse 12. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you help us now. You would uh, give us what we need to hear your word, to think about it, to meditate upon it, to to apply it and take it upon ourselves. Lord, as we hear exhortations, may we receive those in, in the power of the Spirit this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, during a Monday night football game between the Chicago Bears and the New York Giants, one of the announcers observed that Walter Payton the Bears running back, had accumulated uh, over nine miles in his career rushing yardage. In other words, if you're not a football fan, running the football uh, nine miles. And then the other announcer remarked, yeah, and that's with someone knocking you down every 4.6 yards. That's the, the life of a running back. But we are ones who are like that. We're running a race. We're going to be knocked down sometimes. We're going to fall down sometimes. The race is almost like, uh, more like a marathon than anything else. You think of a marathon that it, it about kills the person that runs it. Everybody's told me that. I've never done it. I don't ever plan to do it. But uh, it, it, it sort of knocks you off. People uh, think you're crazy if you run a marathon, usually. Uh, people think we're crazy running the race for Christ. And the time is not important in a marathon. What matters in a marathon is what? Finishing the race, right? Parallel to our running the race. It's not going to be pretty sometimes, but the victory is finishing. And we're surrounded by witnesses. Usually marathons are, have crowds around them. We're surrounded, as he says, with those who have gone before us. And much more important than any Hall of Fame, fame football, football player or marathon runner is the perseverance of the Christian, is the necessity of finishing the race to heaven. This is the race to be run for you, Christian. This is your life. Uh, this contest must be won. Uh, you must finish 
the race you must endure. But you, you might ask, how do you run the race? How do you run? And I think that's what these exhortations are meant to be. How are you sure to finish? Uh, what are the specifics and details? Will you find them here in these exhortations? And the first one is very obvious. If you look at verse 12, uh, it, it's basically saying to us, this has to be done. Uh, you must strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. You must, uh, a failure to do that uh, is, is failure. <laughs> and we must reach down as a runner would reach down and find the strength to finish the race. And interestingly, the limp arms are, are mentioned there and, and the weak knees. Those are the areas of a runner, I'm told, uh, that go first. If their arms are limp, you need your arms to run. It's part of your balance and moves you forward. And knees go next. Wobbly knees. This is exactly describing what a, what a runner is like when they're weary. And maybe you're weary today. Weary of running the race. It also would remind these readers, and should remind us as well of Isaiah 35. I won't be going through every passage, but there are just tens and tens of allusions to the Old Testament in the book of, of, of Hebrews. And there are seven of them in these exhortations here. And one of them is Isaiah 35, 3 through 4. Let me read it to you. It says, strengthen the feeble hands. That's what he's thinking about here. Think of Isaiah 35. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear. Job was told by his friend Eliphaz, think how you, in chapter 4, think of how you have instructed many, how you have strengthened feeble hands. Your words have supported those who stumbled, who have strengthened faltering needs. It was a metaphor of saying, and a way of saying, pick up your legs, strengthen up and straighten up your body. Uh, actually, we get the word orthopedic from this Greek word for strengthen here. It's, it's saying, wake up as a runner on the race. Look at what's at stake here. The only way is forward for you. The only way is onward for you, Christian. Or in Montana, they would say, cowboy up. Cowboy up. Or cowgirl up, if you're a cowgirl. It's what Peter was saying when Jesus says, do you want to leave me as well? Peter said, Who, to whom should we go? What other option do we have, really? We already know you're the truth. We, it doesn't make any difference how hard it is. We have to just keep going here. Are we going to really go back to sin slavery again? Do you really want to go back there? Do you want to go back to Satan and to hopelessness? No, of course not. And so Christian up, Christian. Christian up. Sometimes we just have to dig down and say, I've got to move forward. I don't have all the answers. Things aren't making a lot of sense to me right now, but I've got to just strengthen myself here and move forward. The second exhortation is make level paths for your feet. And here you might think the metaphor has changed from running the race to being a, uh, a construction worker or a road worker, you know, that would clear the way. But it probably simply means stay on your Stay in your running lane here. Stay, stay on course. Uh, go for the level feet. Follow the path where it's level uh, before you. And you would expect the verse to go on to say, so that you can finish the race. It doesn't say that. Read it carefully. It says, so that the lame may be not disabled and the lame may not be disqualified and the lame may get back in the race. The lame might get back on the course. In other words, do this. Strengthen yourself so that others might be strengthened. Think of that. Your perseverance in the faith, whether it's your child or your family or other believers here at Valley, your perseverance helps heal wounded Christians. Your, your running gets them back on course. Your endurance builds up and binds up the injured. And, and in, the, in the way in which God always does this, we minister to other people we are ministered to. We're strengthened as we strengthen ourselves to minister to other people. The writer of Hebrews has been saying that throughout chapter 3, verse 13. He says, encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today. 
Uh, in chapter 10, he says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. One writer put it this way, we are at the back end of the marathon where runners are struggling just to put one foot in front of the other and we require assistance to make it to the finish line. God's race is not the Olympics, it is the Special Olympics. <laughs> and runners are encumbered in so many ways. They're encouraged though to get back on track by one another. Again, that's why the body of Christ is formed by Christ. That's why he wants us together. We're encouraged by each other's faith. You may think that you're going through a trial it just has no sense at all or going through some suffering. But others are watching. Others, not just around you that have gone before you, but others that are living and, and running the race with you. Think of that image of the end of the marathon where just some people are just helping each other across the finish line. That's what we need to be willing to do, to make level paths for others. And I ask you, what are you doing to help another runner to help another Christian along the race to Jesus. It's not about you only. It's about you and others who are running with you. What are you doing to help them along? And that leads to the third exhortation in verse 14, uh, right into making every effort to live at peace with everyone. Uh, running the race is being a peacemaker. That's what he's saying here. And he's probably referring to Psalm 34, 14, where it says, seek peace and pursue it. He's saying that here. And so the idea is not, I'll get along with other Christians as long as they'll get along with me. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, pursue this. Pursue peace. Literally, in the Greek here, he says, follow after peace. Go after peace, in other words. It can sometimes be it's a very aggressive term to make every effort. It, it, it's sometimes translated in the New Testament, persecute. You go after someone when you persecute them. That's what the word is being used here. It's, it's, it's a proactive word to go after peace. Not to just be willing to be peaceful if other people are willing to be peaceful. It's a pursuit of peace. Think of if God would have done that with us. Uh, if he would say to us, when you get your act together and you follow my, my uh, prerequisites or whatever, my, my list of things you need to do, then I'll reconcile with you. That's not what Christ does. Christ just pursues us. He pursues our salvation. If God did it that way, we'd be lost. Now, it's difficult. And it's not all up to us in living with peace with people. As Pastor Jason brought up last week so well. And you know I'm going to quote you my little jingle that I, I quote every time we have anything in the scriptures about conflict. To dwell above with the saints we love. You remember this? Oh, that will sure be glory. But to dwell below with the saints I know, well, that's a different story. <laughs> we can visualize heaven. Oh, it'd be great. What about the... The, the, the body of Christ here. What about God's people here? It's difficult, isn't it? And sometimes we can't, and certainly we never can make anybody do anything else. As far as it lives, uh, depends on you. Paul says, live at peace with, with all men. But we can do much. And sometimes we're not doing enough. Let me ask you this question. I hesitate to, to ask it in some ways. Do you want to bring glory to Satan? Then fight for your rights in the church. That would give him glory. Then be difficult with other people. Stir the pot when you think it's fun to do so. Think you're always right. Hold grudges. Never forget what so-and-so said to you. Play it back in your mind over and over again. And you will give glory to Satan. You will not be giving glory to God. Kent Hughes, in this portion, he's always good, said the, the failure to pursue peace is the most public reason so many never finish the race. Think of that. 
It's usually not people falling out of love in Christ, for Christ. It's that they, are, they leave the church, they leave the faith, usually because of other Christians. And that's all the reason to pursue, make every effort. Go the second and third and fourth mile to pursue peace in the life of the church. Well, fourthly this morning, be holy. When he thinks of keeping peace in the church, he can't stop but thinking about holiness. Well, this comes out of nowhere here, it seems like. But no, unless we're holy people, our seeking peace will do more harm than good usually. It will end in disaster because we won't be humble and we won't be kind and we won't be thinking of the other person. We'll be thinking of ourselves if we're not holy. Kent Hughes also pointed something together that I had never seen before in Matthew 5 and the Beatitudes of Jesus. Blessed is the pure in heart, are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And then you know what the next Beatitude is? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Purity and peace go together. They go right together in this passage too. He thinks of peace in the body and then he thinks of purity right away. It's, it's by no coincidence. We need both and they go together. Do you really want to be holy? I ask you that this morning. First Peter 1 Peter 1.15, the Lord says in, in the Old Testament as well, in Leviticus, be holy as I am holy. I read about half the book so far. I want to read the rest of a book by Kevin DeYoung called The Whole in Our Holiness. It's not the greatest title in the world, but the book is really good. And he talks about the need for holiness in the life of Christ's church today. Let me just read you a couple of paragraphs. He says, I've been largely ig ignorant of camping my whole life. And I'm okay with that. It's one more thing I don't need to worry about in life. Camping may be great for other people, but I'm content to never talk about it, never think about it, never do it. Knock yourself out with the cooler and the collapsible chairs, but camping is not required of me, and I'm fine without it. Here's his connection. Is it possible to you look at personal holiness like I look at camping? It's fine for other people. You sort of expect, respect those who make their lives harder than they have to be. But it's not really your thing. You didn't grow up with the concern for holiness. It wasn't something that you talked about. It wasn't what your family prayed about or your church emphasized. So to this day, it's not your passion. The pursuit of holiness feels like one more thing to worry about in your already impossible life. Surely, it would be great to be a better person, and you do hope to avoid the really big sins, but you're, you figure since you are saved by grace, holiness is not really required of you. And frankly, your life seems fine without it. I wonder if that's true of us. I wonder if that's true of you. He went on to say, my fear is that we rightly celebrate and in some quarters, quarters we rediscover all that Christ has saved us from. We are giving little thought and making little effort concerning all that Christ has saved us to and for. I ask you that. Do you really want to be holy? Is it on your wavelength or on your screen there? And, and, and when we speak of holiness, I must, as your pastor, say two things which the writer of Hebrews brings out here in chapter 10, just four verses apart from one another. In chapter 10, verse 10, he says, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Christ once and for all. So in one sense, as Pastor Jason addressed you, we are holy right now. If you're a believer in Christ, you are holy through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And then four verses later, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 14 says, by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So in one sense, you're holy. and the other sense, you're being made holy. There is a, a position that you have with God right now through Christ that makes you holy. And yet there's a process that you're going through running the race where he wants you to learn to share in his holiness share in his holiness. Well, holiness 
is learning to love what God loves and hate what God hates. Holiness is who God is. It's who he is. That's why we dress him as holy. He is, he is this way. It is what God is like. Therefore, holiness is living like God. That's what it is. It's, it's living who God is. Now, how do we know what God is like? We know through the scriptures, through his commands, through his laws. And God's laws are never arbitrary. God's laws are, are the reflection of who he is. They're the reflection of what God is like. God never does with us what we do with our dogs. We, try to, we give commands to our dogs to see if they'll listen to us. <laughs> they'll see what they'll do. Can we get them to roll over? Can we get them to bark? They're arbitrary commands. They're just based on we as the master. God's laws are never like that. All of God's laws are a reflection of who he is. God's commands, when followed, make us like God. Not ontologically, of course, not in being, but like him morally. And therefore, holiness has to be the purpose of our lives. To be holy is not to be weird. It's to be normal, really. It's to live life as it was meant to be, as you were made to be, as we will be for all eternity. And that's why he says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. You must be holy in both sense, holy made holy by Christ's death, and then holy in your life to stand before God one day. Holiness is not an arbitrary prerequisite. God is not saying, okay, you've got to just be this way and then I'll, you'll be able to see me. No, holiness prepares us to see God. Uh, only those who are holy will be able to see the Holy One. Only those like God can see God. And only the holy really want to see God in the first place. The world doesn't want to see God. They're trying to run away from him. They want God to disappear from their lives. But those who know God, those who are holy in Christ, set apart by him, and made perfect by him, they want to see the Lord. So only those who are like God will see him. This is what John says in 1 John 3, 2. He says, we know that when he appears, Jesus appears, we will be like him. Instant glorification. Instant perfect holiness. And then he says, for we will see him as he is. Something connected to seeing and beholding, coming to that point, will make us holy. And then he says, everyone who has this hope in him, everyone who's looking for that day to see Christ, to see the magnificence and the glory of God, it says, everyone who has that hope in them purifies themselves. In other words, make them, that makes themselves more and more holy. So think about holiness. That's the Christian life. It's running the lace. Holiness is, is the race, really, to be like him as we go to him. But now, let me just give you this one caveat. caveat. If you're, you're hoping you're still here, come back if you're not. Come right here. But how holy do I have to be? Ah, now we're getting down to it, right? Do I have to be 60% holy? Do I have to be 80% holy? William Law said this, quote, we are to consider that God only knows what shortcomings in holiness he will accept. Therefore, we can have no security of our salvation, but by our utmost, but doing our utmost to deserve it. Bad, bad, bad comment. Bad comment. Wesley made a similar one in, in calling people to realize that we, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. He went on to say, warn those who think that uh, they negate this statement by being holy in Christ. He didn't, he didn't watch his words or he didn't understand fully what the holiness of Christ really is. That It does cover us. We are holy in his sight. We're justified by him. But now we're 
changed by him as well. And so we want to be more and more holy. One who has that hope purifies himself even as he is pure. That's what we, we, where direction we're going. So our assurance is in Christ and in him alone. It's, we have it all in him. We're holy in him. His sacrifice makes us holy. And now we're to move on. So the answer to the question, how holy do you have to be? As holy as possible is the answer. As holy as you possibly can be because that's what he's made you to be. Holiness is not like little coins we pick up on a, like a Mario game. You know, we pick up these coins along the way as we make our journey. No, they are the way. They are the road that we're running on. They're the race that we're in the midst of. Holiness is like a, a tra- trajectory that Christ has put us on, the course he's put us on, the direction that we're going. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, keep on that course. Yeah, you'll fall down sometimes. Now you'll be knocked down sometimes. Yeah, you'll forget to help others along the way sometimes. Then you get up. You think of Christ. You think of what he's done and how far you've come. And you move back and you learn to stop for others. Because this is who Christ has made you to be. This is the race that you're on. This is where you're headed. Well, finally, and I'm going to take the short time on these three verses um, of, of verse 15, 16, and 17. Uh, because I think really these verses say the same thing. They're really the same exhortation. Notice how it moves and switches in the text, doesn't it? It moves from the positive to the negative. It moves from do this to don't do this. It moves from strengthen and make level and make every effort and be holy to see to it. See the switch there? In fact, it's, there, there are three subordinate clauses given in the Greek. Lest someone, lest someone, lest someone. Three times in there. It doesn't really come out as well in the English. But basically, it's the three things there. Lest anyone misses the grace of God. Lest anyone, any bitter root uh, spring up. Lest anyone be immoral and godless like Esau. Lest someone be like Esau. Let's take those quickly. Don't miss the grace of God. And this, you might say, is difficult to hear because we just said that we're holy. How could we possibly miss the grace of God? But he's saying to the same people that he told them that they're holy several chapters ago to not miss the grace of God. We are holy and we won't miss it unless we think we don't need it anymore. Unless we think holiness isn't necessary. Unless we leave the faith. Because there are people who can profess faith in Christ and can it actually at some point believe that they don't need God's grace anymore that they have forgotten that they are sinners and need a savior, that they've, they've slipped into a me-centered life, a works righteousness life. The Bible's very plain. We have to finish the race. Or we lose it all. That's the whole point of the book of Hebrews. And it's the point I want to make here again. And what he's saying here, don't let this happen to you. And don't let it happen to other people. Notice it's a thing not just for personal, it's for don't let anyone in the body miss the grace of the Lord. In other words, shepherd one another, care for one another. Strengthen those who are weak. Now, the second one says the same thing, I think. No bitter root grows up and defiles many. And this bitter root, as Pastor Jason brought up in his sermon last, last week on bitterness and anger, is not just the bitterness that can come into a body and spread and defile many. But the background for this, again, is the writer is going through a number of allusions of passages he's thinking of here, is Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy 29 is very clear. It says, make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today 
whose heart turns away from the Lord our God and, and to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there's no root among you that produces such bitter poison. It's talking about apostasy here. It's not just bitterness per se. It's, it's, it's turning away from the Lord. And then it goes on in the next verse of Deuteronomy 29, 19. When such a person hears the words of this oath, he evokes a blessing on himself and therefore thinks, I will be safe even though I persist in going my own way. This will bring disaster on the watered land as well as on the dry. And it goes on to say it will bring disaster in his life as well. In other words, the bitter root is a person who says, I can have Christ and have my sin too. I, I can be a Christian and believe all kinds of other things about other gods and other people's versions as well. And has made a concert effort of that, says and thinks to himself, knows this, is conscious of this. The bitter root is a poisonous root of a person who thinks that sin has no consequences in their life and it will poison them and the whole body. And he's saying here, don't let this be true of you. Don't let it be true of others in the body of Christ. It's not just about you, it's about the others. Make sure that they don't fall into thinking that way. And then the third one, given in, about Esau, is don't be like Esau, he's the example of this. He's the one who was in the covenant and rejected the covenant. He's the one who chooses a meal of lentils over a, the blessing of being in, in relationship and, and, and holy uh, acceptance uh, of, of God, with God. He's the one who lived for his senses, for his sex and for his food and all the things that he wanted. He's the one that didn't value what God valued or what God was offering and giving to him. He was the one that was short-sighted, living for the moment. And the Hebrews were in danger of doing this as well. This is the whole point. That's why he brings this up. They were tempted to trade in their heavenly birthright for temporal relief from persecution and hostility and peer pressure and all the things that they were going through. For Esau, it was tragic, and it will be tragic for the Hebrews. It will be tragic for people in Valley Press as well. Because he wanted at one point, and on some level, the blessing, and it was already over. His actions had shown themselves to who he was, and all his tears couldn't change this. His choices had been revealed, or his choices had rather revealed his heart, as they always do. Esau, you see, in the context here, kept running. Esau, in the context here, missed the grace of God. Esau, in the context here, was the bitter root. And our text ends right there. So we'll pick it up right here next week. No, 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 wait one, one minute. Remember, it was a sermon. and I'm just taking one little glimpse of it here in verses 12 through 17. But it goes on. In verse 18, which we'll cover next week, but Lord willing, text doesn't end here. Because he reminds it. In fact, the word for should be put in there. In the Greek, it's for. You have not come to a mountain. It's connected with what he just said. You've not come to Mount Sinai. You've not come to a mountain of judgment and of, of stay away and don't get any closer and don't approach me. That's not the mountain that we as Christians have come to. We've come to a, a greater mountain, the mountain Zion, the heavenly Zion, to one of joyful assembly, to, to a mountain that God is on welcoming us, to, to, to a mountain that where Jesus is the mediator and where his blood cries out for us. That's the mountain you're on. That's where you stand, Christian. That's where you've come. That's where you are. That's where you belong. Then don't miss it all. Don't throw it all in for something this world could offer you. For a, a meal of lentils. Don't reject what you know is true. But keep running. Never give up. Help 
others along the way with you. Be a peacemaker in Christ's church. Keep going no matter what happens. Keep moving forward to Christ. He waits for you. He's perfecting you. He's here with you now, encouraging you. Run, run the race. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we ask that you help us now as we hear these exhortations and the exhortation of the, of the preacher behind this pulpit that we might continue to run the race you've set before us. Lord, may you assure us again of our salvation, not by only assuring us through the changes you've made in our lives, but even more so by the Savior who will perfect our, our faith and who is drawing us like a magnet to himself along the way. Oh Lord, may we now come to that place uh, as weary travelers, as pilgrims along the way, as runners in a marathon, as those who've been knocked down. And may we come to that table that promises grace, that seals grace. Lord, may we come to the place you've called us to at your table. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. This is the table where the Lord again reminds us that we belong to him, that we're his, that he has died for us and he has shed his blood for us and that his blood covers all our sins. Come to this table as a weary traveler. Come to this table and eat and drink and be refreshed to know that God is as real as the bread you eat and as real as the juice you drink. And that he will save you to the uttermost. If that's not what you believe, then let the bread pass and let the cup pass. Come to Christ. Quit messing around. Come to Christ. Believe and trust in him. He will never forsake you. He will, he will save you to the uttermost. Come to him today. Be baptized, be a part of his church as he calls you. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask you to help us now once again to come to your table. Stop the race for a minute and get nourishment. May you nourish us by the great promises that this table gives us the great assurances that are ours in Christ Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. The night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he offered thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after the supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant. In my name, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.